What is happening, everybody? How are you all today? Welcome to uh, our Tuesday little hangout here, live stream. Oh, wait, hang on. Forgot to turn my other light on. There we go. Now my face is properly lit from two directions. I hope everybody is having a good Tuesday. Um, we started doing these little live streams because I get to talk about a thing and it's just kind of fun and I get to hang out with you. If you have any questions or this live stream content brings up any questions, put it in the comments, uh, put a bunch of question marks beside it and maybe I'll try to grab it. Uh, also, you could use a super chat. I'll stop what I'm doing right then as well. Um, and it also gives me an opportunity to go through the um, comments over the last week and pick some out. I've got some on my phone here. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, that's what we do. Just hang out for a little bit and go through some of this stuff. So, um, you saw the thumbnail. Uh, the reason I brought this up is because uh, I think... Because of the news that came out last week about Fender, which I think is really funny that people, well, anyway, I don't know if you noticed, but Guitar.com picked that story up and then the AP picked it up. So it's all over the internet. There are other people reporting on it now. It's not just me. I did not make it up. It is true. For those of you that are in the comments thinking that it's not, and I'm the only one that's making this up. Anyway, um, it got, it, it really brought out a lot of Fender haters and I, I, I hate that because, um, you know, everybody's just trying to do what they're supposed to do. And the whole thing started because not enough Squires are selling. And so I was thinking, you know, and, th and then this morning I see this story that Phil Cullen from Def Leppard uh, used Squires on the latest record. And a couple of the latest, of the singles that he came up with. Let's see. So this is called Diamond Star Halos. This is the latest uh, Def Leppard record. And he used a Squire Telecaster and a Squire Starcaster. Which is really funny because the Starcaster has terrible pickups in it. Those are the ones that were actually doing the... Um, those are the wide ranges that we're doing all these wide range upgrades on this month. I actually wound a bunch of those today for those of you that have those orders in. Um, and then he used, I think, some Squire basses too. And an Epiphone EB3. He said he was just curious how they would sound when he was recording demos. And so he ended up just using them on the record. So this is really interesting because I have kind of always been a proponent of... Um, I, I've kind of always been a proponent of using whatever and identifying the sound that it's good at, you know, instead of saying I have to have a particular guitar for a particular sound, uh, why not go the opposite and let the guitar drive the creativity, like whatever, because, you know, these cheap guitars, like these Squires and these Made in Mexico uh, strats and tellies. I personally, I don't, not really a big fan of the pickups, but, um, even then, is it just a matter of finding the right combination of stuff to use and having a sound that works for a thing? It might not work for everything. It might only work for a few things. I doubt he played it, ex these cheap guitars exclusively on this record. I think just for a few songs, but when they find a sound that you can use them for, use them for that. And, let the guitar drive the creativity. That's what I find. I find I always play the same thing over and over, especially in videos, but we do that on purpose. We play the same thing over and over in videos on purpose. But when I'm playing alone by myself, I find that the guitar drives what I want to play, right? And so allowing, not worrying about how much the guitar costs or how much you've nerded, nerded out about it or modded it, um, but just letting it drive your creativity in whatever, whatever form, you know, um, and cause none of these guitars are really terrible. There are quality things, obviously that we've been talking about lately. 
Um, we're going to get to some of that as we go over some of these questions. But anyway, I just found that really interesting that I, I, I found it encouraging and I think it's cool. People should look at that and just be like, don't worry about what's on the headstock. Just allow the guitar to drive the creativity. I think that's really, really, really it. I think guitar players on the internet nerd out about this stuff more than guitar players in real life. In fact, I know that to be the case because I work with guitar players in real life and they don't care about half of this stuff. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go through a couple of questions that came in over the internet this week. I've got them here on my phone. You might find the answers to these questions interesting as well. That's, and if you have some questions, I'll try to go through there and find them, put a bunch of question marks in front of the question so I can find it or use a super chat and we will get to you shortly. Um, make sure I didn't miss any yet. Nope. Okay. Uh, that strat that I used in the last video with the, um, highwood saddles and the intonation setup thing. Uh, that sat has such great tone. Is it being recorded through an amp or through a mixer or some sort of a direct box? Thanks for posting. That was recorded. I have been pretty much um, exclusively using the Blackstar St. James 6L6 amp. And that has pretty exclusively been the sound for the probably the last two months of videos all these demos we've been doing because it's super simple and then i have it going into a focus right 18i8 interface which that doesn't affect anything it's just really clean and really good and i'm using some of the impulse responses that are internal to the amp that i've picked from you can there's hundreds of in impulse responses and like speaker combinations and mic placements and all that kind of stuff. And I did go through that um, pretty extensively and thoroughly, like literally just with a guitar in my hand, just like playing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and like switching and clicking and switching and clicking and switching and clicking until I found a combination that I really liked. And again, this is another example of, oh, I'm a 412 guy, so I'm going to use the 412 whatever. No, literally like just clicking through and finding a sound that I liked since I had the flexibility. I think I'm actually using two cabinets IR. I think one of them is a single 12 and one of them is a 212. So it's actually this weird combination, but it doesn't matter. The combination that I had available to me, I could pick one that I liked that sounded good. Um, and more importantly, for my application, sounded good when I recorded it for YouTube. So it's a matter of just finding it like letting go of whatever idea I thought should sound good and finding what actually sounded good. Um, and it works pretty awesome. I will maybe in a video coming up, tell you the actual impulse responses that I'm using when I do it. There's two different ones in the last video. Oh no. In the next video, you haven't seen it yet. We're doing a, review of the St. James 6L6 full review. And I think we used three different guitars in that video. And um, each one of those guitars is a different impulse response because it works differently. It sounds differently with each of those guitars. So I will, we'll dive into, we will dive into that uh, a little bit more, but no super fancy stuff, just the amp straight into the computer. And honestly, you guys, when I record this stuff, I use GarageBand and I don't use any post-processing. Um, people accuse me all the time of doctoring tones, which I think is so dumb, but we don't on purpose because we're trying to like compare things, you know, A, B test, like pickups and different setups and stuff like that. So we don't do anything in post-production. I don't adjust volumes. I don't adjust levels, nothing. Um, we record everything and I do this ahead of time, we record everything at the same level, input level, and then when we edit the video, 
all of everything is at negative six db which is like broadcast spec so like when you hear guitar tone everything is at negative six db so um you know on the meters so that's basically what and then you know of course youtube compresses stuff but um so if you hear a volume difference between this pickup and that pickup, I'm not doing anything. That's all literally, it's all recorded at negative 6 dB. If you're hearing a difference in volume, it's because you're hearing a difference in frequency response between the two pickups. That's really what's happening. So pretty interesting stuff. Uh, let's see. Talking about intonation, this is very interesting. The low E on a Strat can be problematic, even on a nicely set up guitar with normal string gauges like 10 to 46. I've had to remove the spring from the intonation screw to get enough travel to the bridge because the spring was fully compressed. At that point, the, the screw is very close to hitting the string as well. It's not an uncommon issue. Okay, if you are having problems where you are running out of screw travel on your low E on your Strat, there's two things that it could be. Well, there's well, there's a bunch of things, but okay, so let's just go through them. One, number one, check your nut height again. Your nut height is probably too high. If you, uh, if you have to shorten the scale so much, um, the nut height is definitely probably off. Uh, the other thing is your string height is too high. That on a Strat could be a couple of different things. That could be either the string height is too high at the saddle, or it could be that you have your tremolo set too high off of the body. Um, and compounding. So when a tremolo comes up off of the body on a strat, it shortens the entire scale. So then you may have to pull the, the saddle back further to compensate for it. So that's where I would start this whole one string is not within adjustment is bull crap. If you have one string that's whack or you, if it is a factory built guitar, like not a custom shop, not, not like a custom guitar, like somebody made it in their house, but I mean like a guitar that you bought at the store that has been designed by Leo Fender and you cannot get the low E to intonate. That is a setup problem. There is plenty of room there to do that. Um, I would mostly say, I would mostly say that it's probably the height, string height, either on the nut side or on the saddle side. Um, yeah, okay, so looks like we have a few folks talking about various import guitars squires and such that they have played and there are various levels of success with playing these guitars and gigging them and etc hey jim jam jimmy doug um so yeah i mean obviously there definitely is different um uh, different different things if you get a good setup on a squire guitar though it's fine it's totally fine we'll get to a couple of more questions here in a minute um, that will address some specific issues but we did a video a while ago <clears throat> that was talking about what is a quality control issue versus a setup issue like a guitar quality problem versus a setup problem versus an environmental problem and you will find that 90% of issues that are that you have with a guitar that make it either not playable or something that you have to mess with is either setup that doesn't have any of that doesn't reflect at all on the manufacturing or environmental issues that have come into play afterwards. We're going to talk about a couple of those. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. Um, somebody asked here, somebody asked here, let's see, 
Does the neck pickup pull on the strings on an electric guitar myth busted? And somebody answered, well, yeah, well, the force of the magnet of the string simply cannot be zero. You are correct. So there must be some drag on the string from the pickup. Um, and then he goes into this long explanation of the things that you could check to minutely check this. The bottom line is it doesn't matter. The bottom line is if you're spending hours to figure out how much a magnet is pulling on a string, you are wasting your time and you should be playing guitar. Number one. Number two, the science just isn't there. The magnetic dipole moment mathematic equation says, hang on, let me grab a pickup. I happen to have a strap pickup right here. Says that the diameter of this magnet and the length of this magnet and the Gauss reading of this magnet calculated with the mass of the steel that is above it and the distance that is above it says that while it can live within the space of the magnetic field, the mass of the string is too small, the distance is too far, and the strength of the magnet is too weak for it to have any real effect. Now, it is living within that magnetic field at rest, yes. But if it were closer, like all the way down, all the way down here, then yeah, it would pull on it. But there's a crossover point and it's exponential as you pull the string away from the magnet uh, that that magnetic force goes away. And it's all can be mathematically figured out. It's This is not a theory. This is not a, oh, I think you're wrong or I disagree with you. I mean, you could disagree all you want. I don't care. But um, <clears throat> this is not a, um, you didn't think of this or that or whatever. This is, it's, it's one plus one equals two, only it's not because there's a bunch of square roots and calculus. But it is a mathematical equation that cannot be argued with. So I don't know why people continue to argue with it. And they're going to say, well, yeah, I play this strat and it makes this warbly noise. Well, it's because your pickups are too close. That's all it is. Pull them away a little. That's all it is. Your pickups are not adjusted properly. Um, it is science. Science is easy as long as you understand where to look. Um, somebody was asking about the close acoustic guitar with the neck that comes off. Um, this is another one where people make up problems where there aren't any problems. Um, this, this, <laughs> this is what most comments on all these videos are. Um, I'm wondering how much the break it down feature affects intonation, especially over time. I don't know how continually removing and reattaching a guitar neck affects that, especially if it's removed. It go usually when it's removed, it goes through a full setup. Um, okay, so like on a strat or something, they're just loose and jangly. Like there's everything's loose. Like the neck pockets aren't tight. The the it's wood. Uh, things can move around. But on a 100% carbon fiber guitar, the way those things are with the machine screws and the way everything works. Um, it can be put back together and it can be back together in exactly the same place every time. The saddle goes in exactly the same spot every time. The everything goes back in exactly the same spot every time. And since we talked about this before, intonation is just math. It's just, is it in the same spot that it was before? Over time, I can understand the concern, however, if it's machined properly and done correctly, and I will tell you that this guitar is made very, very well, um, it's a non-issue. Um, what are some other examples? I mean, rifles, pistols. You know, every time I clean my pistol and I take it apart and put it back together, I don't have to worry about the slide not aligning where it goes or the barrel doesn't go in the same spot that it's supposed to go or like, um, right when a rifle receiver comes off the, um, the barrel comes off the receiver, it, it goes back on in the same place. If the machining is right. I mean, again, these are not problems. They're just problems that people want to make up when they don't want to believe that something is cool. 
Same comment every time. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a few, somebody said classic vibe or affinity. Uh, I've bought a bunch of those classic vibe or uh, the one, some of those affinity guitars and they're really good. Um, they're really, really good. They, uh, for 200 and I think they're 279 now. So they've kind of crept up there a little bit, but they're really good guitars. Um, I would not be afraid of buying one for my daughter or for, I actually, um, speaking of that, I, I bought one a few months ago. We did a video on it and I gave it to my friend in Florida. I bought it as a gift for him and drove it down there and gave it to him. That guitar was fantastic. We had to fix the frets. There was some little sharp stuff on the frets, um, but we're going to get into that in a minute with another question. Um, yeah, everybody's saying, yeah, the, uh, Everybody's saying that the, the gun analogy is true. It, there's all kinds of things like that that you can take apart and put back together a hundred times and they're fine. Now an old guitar, you can't because an old guitar is an old guitar and everything moves around and it's loose and like Fender guitars. I'm going to do a video about this and you are not going to like it, but it is literally going to be why PRS is better than Fender on all of these like double cut things like the silver sky because the fender guitar is not a good guitar by design it's a easy to build easy to manufacture guitar but it is not the perfect design everybody says that like about italian stuff but it's just not true when you look at engineering stuff i mean i love them obviously i love them they're fantastic. I love tellies. I actually ordered one the other day. I'm not telling you what it is, but I ordered another telly the other day. It's probably my favorite guitar of all time, but they're not good. They're, they're not, you know. Uh, let's see. They're not designed properly, is what I'm saying. Uh, question on plecking. So this is where the quality versus, um, how do you want to say, the quality versus workmanship craftsmanship design comes into play here gibson plex guitars does plucking address fret sprout because i have gone into several shops looking to purchase a firebird and every one of them has fret sprout issues and every shop quoted me a cost for fixing it i could also dress the fret sprout myself but i feel like if i'm paying that much for a guitar it should be perfect there's a couple of different things here Fret sprout is not a result of manufacturing. Fret sprout is an environmental issue. Um, as a guitar dries out, now it can be, um, for okay, if you built a guitar in your garage, and when you built that guitar, the humidity of that guitar, the garage was too high, and the moisture content of the wood was too high, and then you built that guitar, and then it dried out and it had fret sprout, that would be on you as a manufacturer. But most of these manufacturers, and I won't get into who I think is better than who, but they will, they will um, control their wood before they build a guitar. So then they put the guitar together and then it rides in a 100 degree UPS truck across the country. <clears throat> Or it might go to Seattle and sit in a rainy, high humidity warehouse for however long. And then you go to the guitar store and pick it up or feel it. And it's got fret sprout because the guitar store has then brought the humidity back down, to, you know, 45 or 50 percent. And now the thing's got fret sprout. If you have sharp fret ends, 99% um, of the time. That is an environmental issue. That is not a manufacturing problem. Now, that being said, there are some guitars who ha that have come from the manufacturer, like that Silver Strat that I played in that video the other day. That was terrible. It was like they freaking used toenail clippers to clip the fret ends. It was not good, <clears throat> and I had to fix it. It's not that the fret was sprouting out of the wood it's that the ends of the frets were cut off so harshly and not finished very well. So 
Now, the next part of your question about having a guitar store fix it, I would go to a different guitar store. If if I have if I'm going to spend twenty seven hundred bucks or whatever the things cost, um, and there's fret sprout on it, I want it fixed before I leave too. And um, if it is a reputable guitar store, like a good one, like not Guitar Center, they should take a few minutes and fix that for you. I think. And I know there will be people that work at guitar stores and be like, yeah, we can't do that with every guitar. Eh, expensive guitars, you probably can. Um, I think you probably can. And I think it's important on the customer retention side of things to do it. I just think it's really, really important. Um, Jack Pearson from the Allman Brothers plays Squires. Yeah. I wouldn't make a total generalization about that. He has played Squires. He doesn't constantly play Squires. Don't ask me how I know, because I'm not going to tell you right now, but I know. And I think that's, uh, I think all of that too. Well, this guy, this guy, all he does is he plays cheap guitars. Yeah, no, nah, not really. Um, and somebody asked about temperature. Yeah, we're talking about relative humidity here. Relative humidity is more important than temperature. Um, if you buy a bike in a bike shop, you expect the gears to be adjusted in the price. Same applies to it's the dealer's responsibility. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're buying a $200 guitar, I I wouldn't do it either because there's no profit in that guitar. There's no space for it. Um, but then again, if the person who's buying the $200 guitar is signing up for lessons, they're coming in every week, they're now a lifelong customer. Customer retention is a huge thing, um, and it's an important part of business, and I think that that needs to be looked at. It's not just the dollars on the front end. It's the, it's the long-term relationship that you should be building with the person when they buy a product from you. I think about it every day when we make pickups, like... Um, you would be so you probably wouldn't be surprised actually um at the percentage of repeat business that we get because i really care about it like i really care about people really you know what i mean and how how that works i'm not just selling you a product and expect you to just flounder with it i want it to be good but some people don't really do that some dealers suck as nicholas says it's totally true um, a cheaper, well set up guitar will be a higher priced, badly set up guitar any day. Not any day, but um, a lot of times, a lot of times, and it can make a big, big difference. I, I, I agree that it can make a big difference. Um, I think people try to make generalizations with this stuff too much, and it's just like, I mean, and I know I do too, but you know. Uh, let's see. I think that was the last one. Let me go through here and see if there is any. Let's see. Fender Acoustasonics have terrible fret sprout. See, okay, so Camille, here's a here's a thing where I'm going to say, be careful how you say that. Fender Acoustasonics don't have terrible fret sprout as a rule. Uh, I played tons of them. They're fine. The guitars that were in the store where you bought it had them because of where the store was. That had nothing to do with the guitar. Most of the time, this stuff doesn't have anything to do with the guitar. Um, anyone telling you, anyone in the business will tell you that retaining a customer is 10 times better than relying. It is so. Um, I don't think it's exactly 10 times now, Jim, but it's pretty close. That That's an old school number that they would use for like furniture stores and car dealers and stuff. But they would say that it, it would cost you 10 times the amount of advertising and stuff to retain or to get a new customer 
than to retain an old customer and have a repeat customer. The number is not quite the same anymore because of the way marketing works, because we have YouTube and we have social media and stuff. So marketing is cheaper, but uh, the principle is definitely there. Um, and I will say that I'm, I'm sure that it uh, is definitely better. Yeah. Um, my last Paul went to the tech three times for the frets. I finally fixed it myself after finding your channel. Oh, thanks, dude. Also, um, get a new guitar tech. That's another thing. I think we need to really reconsider how we feel about how we work on our guitars and what we expect from them. Not because guitars are getting worse, because on the whole, they're not. There are some people that are having trouble, like right now, like Fender's gonna have trouble. Fender will have trouble for the next foreseeable future because, and this was another thing that came up in the comments this week a lot. People were like, well, they should fire all those people if the rework rate is so high. Well, the problem is, is that uh, the rework rate is so high because turnover is so high. Um, I said it in the video and people apparently weren't paying attention or didn't want to listen to that part. But basically, um, through COVID and in over the last year, uh, it has been very difficult for people to retain employees. And I did not give, and I, I still won't because I don't want to, it's a detail that I don't want to, basically, the average experience level of the person working at Fender is a lot lower than it used to be because of that. And the problem with firing everybody because they think they suck is because then you just have to hire new people and train them again instead of tighten up the ones that you already have. This goes to our retention versus replace situation we are just talking about. Um, and so Fender really shot themselves in the foot with the quality thing, getting rid of those people because now they just have to train new people. The thing is, is that was an, a shift. So now hopefully they'll be able to focus more on the folks that are working in the one shift that's still working and bring the quality up fairly quickly. I think it will happen but I think there's gonna be a period of time in here. Okay, all that to say, I don't have a problem, and I am might be in the minority here, but I tech every guitar that I buy. Um, <laughs> this is, except my PRSs, because they're perfect, and my McPherson, because it was perfect, but they're in a different league. Those, those brands are in a different league. But I think even an SE, like my PRS SE that came in, uh, my Silver Sky SE, I had to tech that guitar. I think every guitar, you're going to have to tech some. Um, whether you do it yourself by learning stuff and doing it yourself, or every new guitar, and I just did a video on this a couple months ago, every new guitar should go to Guitar Tech for a setup. Every one. Because they're going to come, all guitars come with a, um, like a median setup that's like middle of the road. That's not necessarily how you play. I think Phil McKnight did a really good job of this when he did his whole, what is the 55 point inspection at um, Sweetwater? He did this video a few weeks ago. And he really honed in on the fact that it's not a setup. They're just making sure that the guitar exists and all the parts are on it and that it works. And it is within a factory kind of range, but it is not a setup. Um, they're just making sure that the guitar showed up and there's no major problems with it. And a setup issue is not on the manufacturer. As long as it comes and it's like, Factory setup on a Telecaster is two millimeter string height at the 12th fret. That's high. The thing is, you can't just lower it to one and a half. You'll get fret buzz. You have to go through the entire setup on the guitar to get it lower. But that's factory spec. If you Google Telecaster factory spe specification on a Telecaster, 
for a long time, maybe they changed it now, but for a long time, there was a little table and it said two millimeters on the low E, which is really high. Um, that's not how I want it. I want it lower than that. Well, to get it lower than that, you got to go through the entire setup process. Neck relief, nut height, string height, um, intonation, adjust your pickups, check the frets to make sure that you can get as low as you want, the whole deal. That's not on the manufacturer. They shot for a number and they hit a number and you didn't like it. That doesn't make the guitar suck and that doesn't make the guitar manufacturer suck either. And even a Squire, these $200 guitars, you pick them up in 99% of the time, they're within that range. It's just a matter of the fact that they are not set up for you. Every guitar you buy should go to your guitar tech and have a setup outside of what you expect from the guitar store. Um, I think that's just my opinion, but I think that should be part of your guitar purchasing pro process that you should set aside 50 or 75 bucks. It's usually about what it is these days, um, to have a good setup by a good guitar tech. And that to me is who the, that's the guy you should make your relationship with. Yeah. You should have a relationship with your guitar store. So, but you know, that's, that's a thing that they should try to develop with you but I wouldn't worry about developing a relationship with them. I would worry about developing a relationship with your guitar tech, the guy that you go to and he knows how you play over time and you can just drop a guitar off to him and pick it up and know it's going to be right because you've got this relationship with this guy. Your guitar tech is the guy that you should. And I know you say it sounds fancy to say I have a guitar tech, but we all should. I think we all should if we're not going to do it ourselves. Now I I'm hoping that with this channel, we teach everybody and they know enough to have a good guitar. But for those of you that don't want to do it, um, I have a good, I have one. There's stuff I don't want to do and I take it to somebody. I mean, there's certain things that I don't like doing and I don't, I hate doing frets. I hate doing fret work. It's like I do it and I'm good enough to do it and it's good. Um, and if you like, if you bought that silver strat as for sale, if you buy that guitar, I did the fret work on it and it's good. It plays great, but I'm not going to be like, Hey guys, I do fret work. I'm not going to tell anybody cause I don't want to do it all the time. Um, and I hate doing it. So I take it to a guy. I got a guy that does it. Um, yeah. So, you know, of course you get a guitar and knobs don't work or switches don't work or pickups are broken or you know you got a fret coming out or you know any crazy things like that but i think um good quality retail retailer um that's why i have no problem buying from sweetwater and i know that i get an affiliate commission from them but i also tell you that and i'm saying that and i, I get an affiliate commission from them but I buy most of my guitars from them because um, unless I get a wild hair and like cruise into guitar center and see something and buy it real quick. But um, our local guitar stores, people ask me, I guess I'll, I'll tell you that. So people ask me why I, we have a couple of local guitar stores here. The reason I don't support them is because they don't support me. As simple as that. Um, or Sweetwater supports me. <laughs> so um, that's why. And the guys here, they just don't, I mean, I've tried to, to develop a relationship with them and they don't like it. They don't want to do it. So, um, which is a bummer because it would be cool, you know? Um, so I like a kind of a symbiotic relationship that you can build with a guitar store. And I just don't feel like I have that with them. And we, we're kind of limited, you know, especially in a smaller town. Um, I'm annoyed that I will have to put another four to five hundred dollars into a six hundred dollar guitar. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. People are people are complaining a lot about guitars being too expensive right now, but eggs are too expensive right now. I, you know, it's just a cascading thing. I mean, parts for guitars are more expensive, so guitars have to be more expensive. Wood is more expensive, so guitars have to be more expensive. People think that it's this big cash grab, 
by you know these big corporate companies raising their prices that's why it's now it's actually because wood is more expensive and tuners are more expensive and pickups are more expensive copper if you knew what i will tell you i'll tell you right now i'll tell you right now these magnets that go in a strap pickup have doubled in less than a year doubled wire has gone up 20 percent uh the flak work hasn't changed that much but that's because i have a good relationship with my buddy bobbins have doubled base plates have doubled telecaster covers have doubled humbuckers have almost humbucker covers have almost tripled um because nickel um ever since the whole and i don't want to get into politics so don't get all weird in the comments but um ever since the russia ukraine thing happened nickel prices have gone way up and if you think about what we do as guitar players everything has nickel in it base plates the covers the strings like everything has nickel in it frets everything and nickel prices have gone way way up so and magnets too so we are literally paying double for the parts that we build pickups with i am really trying to not raise prices but when when a guitar when the parts double in a guitar over the scale of how business works i can understand why a mexico guitar play guitar has gone from 749 to 849 in the last two years i can 100 percent understand it and to be fair the person who's building the guitar has to pay three dollars a dozen for eggs and last year he had to pay a buck and a half i mean it just it's all the same you know um hey chris how you doing so yeah it just depends it's it's just a thing it's the way life is it's not a guitar manufacturer trying to capitalize on a situation i mean eight quarter hardwood is currently ten dollars per board foot so this is the interesting thing about wood prices oh we got a super chat hang on uh these things went up in price if you can find them yeah i mean that's that's the other part is finding a guitar i just waited a year for a guitar and then i waited nine months for another guitar and the guitar i just ordered the other day i have to wait until october i ordered it three days ago i have to wait till october for it and it's a tally i mean good grief so you know thanks for the super chat dave i appreciate that so yeah i mean i feel like it's uh Oh, Chris has the Squire. He has the white thin line Squire that we used, that we did a couple weeks ago. He bought that from me. Um, by the way, if you see a guitar that is demoing that we're using on the channel and you want to buy it from me, basically what I do with these, um, right now I have a Strat, is we do all the upgrades on it and then I sell it for whatever I paid for it. So like I paid $849 for that made in Mexico Strat. Put all new pickups in it put the high wood saddles in it i'm actually i got a single single hump pick guard over here i'm thinking about putting a single single hump setup in it um whole new loaded pick guard you know which is 350 bucks or whatever and then just selling it for whatever i paid for it so if you want a good strat and of course it's all the setup's gonna be done all the little problems that you would have with buying a brand new one like we've been just talking about those are all solved as well and you get just a really good guitar um so anyway yeah and of course, as you know, I don't play them very much because I have my guitars to play. So they're just kind of sitting. You ordered an EV2 two years ago? Dang! And you have two more years to wait? That's ridiculous. Wow. There are some guitars I am not selling. Um... But there are some that might get on the chopping block pretty soon that may surprise you. We'll have to see. I'm not sure. I'm not selling my Gibson. I'm not selling my PRSs. And what do I got back there? Probably not going to sell my 
Machine Gun Kelly Schechter either. I really like that guitar. You guys, that's the sleeper of all of them lately. The Machine Gun Kelly Pink Telly. That thing is freaking amazing. I love it. I play it all the time. Can you make pickups with a Gilmore-ish tone? Yeah, that's really easy. Super easy. Um, buy our Classic 5 set, and that'll get you right there. And then you can put a push-pull in it or an extra micro switch for the neck bridge combo, and I think you'll dig it. Oh, EV, I thought you were talking about a, I thought you were talking about a guitar. I thought you were talking about like a, um, yeah, anyway, cool. Yeah, we, we thought about ordering an electric car. I was looking at it the other day and I'm just like, nah, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to. Um, Let's see, what else do we got going here? High prices make me more humble. I can't afford a new guitar, so I just mod and adjust my Jazz Master. Now it's a beast. Yeah, dude. You know, that's the other thing, too. I think that's... So that's one of the reasons why we were started doing some more modding videos. And we're, I wanted... I had a bunch of product reviews that I wanted to do, and I'm like, eh. Nobody cares about buying new stuff right now. They want to like hop up their old stuff. So we're going to do some more stuff like that, I think, pretty soon. So, yeah, man. Cool. Well, if y'all don't have much more questions, uh, see if you can sneak them in there really quick at the end. And then we will probably talk to you. Well, tomorrow we have, uh, tomorrow we have news. So uh, we're going to shoot news tomorrow morning, edit it right away and get it get it up. Um, I'm pretty excited that I'm actually not editing my own stuff anymore. We hired a video editor. Finally, I've been able to hire a video editor. So for the last few v weeks of videos you've seen, he's been doing it and it's been making my life so much easier uh, because we are busier around here. So um, my 40th anniversary Squire Jazzmaster is totally roadworthy. Dude, I am glad. That's awesome. Our Epiphone Pro level guitars. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's a bunch of players that play Epiphone guitars. Gary Clark? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people. So, yeah, man. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for hanging out for a few minutes. Uh, I'm glad we were able to just chat and, uh, you know, do this kind of stuff. And we will talk to you probably tomorrow. Well, we will talk to you tomorrow at noon. It's not going to be live. It's going to be the normal deal that we've been normally doing. Uh, but we'll see you tomorrow at noon.